Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Anzu Wiley and some dinosaur news. So first in the news, in Lehigh, Utah, a museum is receiving 125 million year old dinosaur skeletons which are encased in a nine ton block of plaster and they believe there might be as many as 10 Utah raptor skeletons inside of it. The find was discovered about 15 years ago north of Arches National Park and it's taken quite a while to get them excavated and get them over to the museum. Paleontologists looking at these dinosaur skeletons believes that they may have died while being caught in quicksand. And if that's the case, it might be the first documented example of dinosaurs trapped in quicksand fossilizing. Next in the news is a non-dinosaur discovery, but from the dinosaur era. It was a nine-foot-tall crocodile-like species called Carnufex carolinesis. And it looked just like a crocodile, except that it was probably bipedal on its larger rear legs with shorter forearms. It was around about 231 million years ago and was discovered in North Carolina just recently. This puts it in the late Triassic, so there were dinosaurs around at the same time, despite some news stories saying that it was pre-dinosaurs. It really wasn't. It was just before some of the most well-known dinosaurs. The discoverers note that because it was only nine feet long, once dinosaurs came into the scene, it would have lost all the competition that it had and probably would have starved or been eaten by larger predators. Pioneer College professor David Smith has done some new research into the vertebrae of the Nothronychus species of dinosaur, and basically... His expertise is in vertebrae and how they attach and what structure they may have had. And he says that it was commonly perceived that this Nothronychus was more like a ground sloth without a rigid and flexible backbone. But based on his new research, he thinks that it probably stood more in the 10 to 12 feet tall and 15 to 20 feet long ratio, making it more upright and his depiction of it shows it as being bipedal rather than walking on all fours and having a flexible neck that more resembles an ostrich. It seems like every week we've come up with a new dinosaur that's ostrich-like. <laughs> so maybe a lot of people's visions of dinosaurs is changing pretty dramatically. Of course, there's always Jurassic Park and Jurassic World news. The top story definitely this week is it seems that they've confirmed a Jurassic World sequel already, even before Jurassic World comes out. So the director, Colin Trevorrow, has hinted at the possibility of a sequel. And in a recent interview with Empire, he says, quote, We wanted to create something that would be a little bit less arbitrary and episodic, and something that could potentially arc into a series that would feel like a complete story, end quote. So it sounds a lot like he's going to make some more movies to fit the same plot line. We've talked about Thomas R. Holtz Jr. before too, and he also came out recently saying that he's really disappointed in the new dinosaurs and the fact that they're not using modern understanding of what dinosaurs appeared like. Specifically, he said, quote, the original movies brought the dinosaur research of the 1980s to 1990s viewers and the latest one seems to bring the dinosaur research of the 1980s to the 2010 viewers, <laughs> end quote. So basically, we talked about some of the influences and the books that Steven Spielberg was reading back when the original Jurassic Park came out, and they were the best understanding of dinosaurs at the time. But we now know that dinosaurs have feathers, they acted differently, T-Rex could see motion, all this kind of stuff. And they're ignoring all of it for basically consistency purposes and not really respecting the evolution of the science. I'm not that upset about it because I understand that it's fiction and everything, but it would be cool if they added some more real feathery, realistic dinosaurs. 
think part of their reasoning is that these are genetically modified dinosaurs, so in some cases things happen and that's what made them different. Yeah, so maybe they'll try to talk their way out of it a little bit more. Hopefully. <laughs> the other big piece of Jurassic Park news is that a father-daughter team have created a stop-motion version of the original Jurassic Park film, but only a three-minute long version with the biggest action scenes. It's pretty cool. They actually used an estimated $100,000 worth of Lego blocks to create it, and they have a neat behind-the-scenes portion at the end where they show how they made it. It's actually incredibly impressive, so if you're into Legos or you like stop-motion videos, you should check out the video on YouTube. There are several local dinosaur attractions, depending on where you live. Up first is Lost Creatures of the Cretaceous, which is put on by Dinosaur Discovery in Queensland, Australia. They have 20 animated life-size dinosaur models, including T-Rex and Australovenator. They also released a Dinosaur Discovery app, which is on iTunes and Google Play. It's going to be there from March to October of 2015, and tickets are about $15. We've mentioned North Carolina quite a bit in the last few episodes, and there's a new dinosaur attraction coming there. At the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, there's an activity called Oh What a Relief. It shows you and teaches you in hands-on experience how to make your own fossil representations. The full title of the class is Oh What a Relief Faux Fossil Modeling and Mold Making Class. And it's for children ages 11 and up, but I don't know, you could probably go if you're an adult. It's $25 a person. It's going to be there between March 26th and April 2nd, and it's 6.30 to 8 at night. So if you have a free evening and you're in North Carolina, you should definitely go. And last but not least, in Singapore, there's an area called Marina Square. If you live there, you're definitely familiar with it. It's right in the center of the most touristy part of town. <laughs> and they're doing a giant balloon dinosaur event. It's just a whole bunch of dinosaurs made out of balloons as if the balloons were Lego bricks or something. It's really cool. We saw a version of one of these at Field Station Dinosaur in Secaucus, New Jersey. They had a little baby T-Rex made out of balloons. It's kind of like a huge balloon animal. It's pretty cool. So if you're in Singapore, you should definitely go check it out. And that's it for the news. Our dinosaur of the day is Anzu Wiley, which is named after a bird-like demon in Mesopotamian mythology. And the Wiley part of the name comes from a boy named Wiley, who was a dinosaur enthusiast and grandson of a Carnegie Museum of Pittsburgh trustee. So a whole bunch of paleontologists studied Anzu. It includes Dr. Matthew Lamana from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and Dr. Hans Dieter Seuss and Dr. Tyler Lyson from the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History, as well as Dr. Emma Schaechner from the University of Utah. So three different Anzu skeletons have been found, and Dr. Tyler Lyson first found the bones of the third skeleton when he was a teenager visiting his uncle's ranch in North Dakota. There are, th again, three skeletons, but these are partial skeletons found in both North and South Dakota in the Hell Creek Formation, which was formed at the end of the Cretaceous period, about two million years before non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Lyson, when he found the bones in 2009, said that they were just sticking out of the ground. So uh, even though the bones were discovered a few years ago, the research was published in the Public Library of Science 1 journal in 2014. Dr. Lamana said, quote, Anzu is far and away the most complete canonothid that has ever been discovered. After nearly a century of searching, we paleontologists finally have the fossils to show what these creatures looked like from virtually head to toe. And in almost every way, they're even weirder than we imagined, end quote. So Anzu lived in the Hell Creek Formation, which is known for Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops fossils, which at the time was a wet floodplain. So Anzu has been described as the chicken from hell because it looks strange and it was found in the Hell Creek Formation. And Anzu, as Sabrina mentioned, is a bird-like demon from Mesopotamian mythology. So 
the Hell Creek formation gave them inspiration to name it after a hellish demon. <laughs> and it had a bony crest on the top of its head, as well as a long tail. Because of that, it's considered to be very bizarre, and it has a big beak and a sliding jaw joint that could have been used to eat plants as well as meat. Overall, Anzu was about the size of a small car, had claws and feathers on the upper arms, and was also described as a cross between an emu and a modern reptile. It was about 11 feet long, 5 feet tall at the hip, and weighed between 440 and 660 pounds. It had a toothless beak, and the crest on its head was very similar to a cassowary. If you haven't looked up a cassowary, you should really check it out. It's a crazy looking, super aggressive bird that's down in Australia. Anzu is part of the Canagnathid family, which are a group of theropods in the Oviraptosauria group. Anzu looked like a big flightless bird with a long slender neck and hind legs, again looking like a cassowary or an ostrich, which Garrett mentioned a lot of dinosaurs these days being compared to looking like ostriches. Close relatives of Anzu have been found to have feathers, so Anzu probably also had feathers, but it also had large sharp claws and a long tail. So there's a bit of a history to the Cagnognathids group. Because of Anzu, paleontologists now know for sure that Anzu, Cagnognathus, and Chirostenotus are in their own group in Oviraptosauria, and that Giganoraptor, which is the largest Oviraptosaur known wing, 1.5 tons, also belongs to the Cagnognathida group. Some in this group are small and the size of a turkey, but they are a very diverse group. Until Anzu, Cananacthids were the least understood over raptosaurs because it was only known from very incomplete fossils, so scientists had no idea what they looked like. So even though Anzu had such a strange looking head, it, what's w interesting is that its body was very similar to Velociraptor, even though Velociraptor lived a few million years earlier. Based on its skeleton, we believe that Anzu was an omnivore, and ate vegetation, small animals, as well as probably eggs. So oviraptors are an interesting group because they were kind of wrongly named for stealing eggs. That's interesting, Anzu, if they actually ate eggs. It's part of the oviraptosaurus group. Based on fossil remains, it appears that Anzu got a lot of injuries throughout its life. Two of the three Anzu specimens that have been found so far had pretty serious injuries. One had a broken and healed rib, and the other had an arthritic toe bone, which was caused by a fracture where a tendon ripped off a piece of the bone. It's unclear whether Anzu fought within the species, or if they were fighting larger predators like T-Rex. So again, Anzu is classified in multiple groups. There's the Kenignathids, and there's the larger group Oviraptosauria. So Anzu is the first of its kind in the group Oviraptosauria, which is found mostly in Central and East Asia, to show that this group also lived in North America. They probably migrated across the land bridge. It's also the largest Oviraptosaur found in North America so far, though not the largest Oviraptosaur ever. Again, Giganoraptosaur, which was discovered in Mongolia in 2005, was much larger at one and a half tons and 24 feet long. The most complete skeleton of Anzu was 80% complete, and according to Dr. Suze and his team, Anzu proves that dinosaurs were still evolving when they suffered the mass extinction event, which helps prove that it was an asteroid that killed the dinosaurs and not climate change or another catastrophe. So just going back to the Hell Creek Formation, even though it's been well excavated, scientists think that there's a lot more species that can be found there. For example, in December 2014, there was a new raptor that was found in Hell Creek. And there's still probably a lot of dinosaurs to find in Central Asia. So the three Anzu skeletons are currently housed in the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh. But I don't think they're currently on display, so you probably can't see them right now, unfortunately. So just to get into a little bit more about the Canagnathid group and Oviraptosaurus group, the name Oviraptosaur comes from the first skeleton that was found in 1924, and it was on top of a dinosaur egg nest. 
scientists thought that it was stealing the eggs, but in the 90s, they found a baby oviraptoroid egg inside a nest, which showed that oviraptosaur was actually just a good parent protecting its eggs and not a thief. <laughs> there are more than a dozen known oviraptorid species. Canonathids, oviraptorids, and other species from China are closely related, so paleontologists started grouping them together in a theropod group, oviraptosauria. Having oviraptosaurs in Asia and North America makes sense because, as Sabrina mentioned earlier, they were connected at the time of dinosaurs and there was a lot of migration between the two points. The name canonathid means recent jaws. The first canonathids found were thought to be close relatives of birds, like ostriches, because they had similar lower jaws. Now scientists are thinking that the similarity just evolved in convergent evolution rather than being a descendant. The Canonathid family, along with the family Oviraptoridae, is part of the superfamily Canonathoidea. Charles Whitney Gilmore found the first Canonathidae fossils in 1914, which were the hands of Chirostenotus in Alberta, Canada. In 1940, a new species called Canonathus kalinzi was found and put in the Canonathus group because of its similar lower jaw. And the most primitive Canonathid is Canonathasia marinsoni, which was found in Uzbekistan. So again, Canonathids and Oviraptorids are part of the same Oviraptosauria group, but Canonathids even though they're similar to Oviraptoridae, they have distinct jaws. They're long and shallow and not as powerful of a bite. And their lower jaws had ridges and shelf-like structures, which was a crushing surface. They were also hollow and air-filled as part of an air sac system. And canonathids are also lighter than Oviraptorids, with slender arms and long legs. They also had specialized beaks, long necks, and short tails with feathers. And some canonathids had short, deep beaks, while others had shovel-shaped beaks. Another difference between canonathids and oviraptorids is that canonathids tended to live in humid floodplains, while oviraptorids lived in arid areas. There are about 12 named canonathid species, but they may not all be valid. Some of them come from fragments of skeletons. Our fun fact of the day is dinosaur eggs are found in many different shapes and sizes. Most, but not all, are spherical, and some can be almost a foot long, but the smallest one found so far is only about one inch long. Fossilized eggs are hard like rocks, but they retain their structure through fossilization, and there have been a lot of them found throughout the last couple centuries. And that's all for this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.